All right, uh, we are fired up here tonight for the Best in Soccer Talk. Big night tonight on Soccer Matters, and thank you for tuning in. We stream at ESPN975.com. You can call in at 713-780-3776. Soccer Matters question of the week. What manager would you like to play for? If you were a player, what manager would you like to play for? 713-780-3776. Producer Guillermo guiding the show here tonight. And you can hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at Glenn Davis Sock. A big thank you, as always, to our presenting sponsors. Uh, that is John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. DaspitLaw.com. John and his firm, personal injury attorneys. And they are bringing soccer talk to you. Uh, we have a lot of Premier League uh, talk here tonight. Um, we will also uh, get into a World Cup 2026 update that's going to be uh, brought on Sunday. We'll get to that. African Cup of Nations, we're on to the quarterfinals tomorrow. And, of course, the summer, uh, yeah, you can pinch yourself. we got the Copa America here. Uh, but we had a lot of drama today here in the Premier League, so I think uh, we're going to start with that. Uh, we will take your calls at 713-780-3776. 713-780-3776. Dynamo Down uh, doing preseason in Guadalajara. Uh, we heard that uh, yesterday uh, Sebas Ferreira scored a goal and uh, working on a, a deal to uh, bring Jan Gregush, uh, formerly in Minnesota United, to the Dynamo midfield. So uh, that's a little bit what's uh, going on there. By the way, former Dynamo Memo Rodriguez signing with Sporting Kansas City. Um, I got some thoughts on that as well. So uh, the Jurgen Klopp uh, farewell tour continues. Now, it's interesting. When a manager announces that he's leaving, it's interesting to see if the rallying cry now becomes do it for Jurgen, right? So uh, they absolutely thrashed Chelsea at Anfield. Jota in the 23rd, Bradley in the 39th. We're going to talk about the 20-year-old from Northern Ireland, uh, Liverpool Youth Academy guy. Um, only a second Premier League appearance. Jobazaslai and Diaz had the four goals. So four in a row now for Liverpool, the difference between a football team and a group of individuals. Um, that's something you have to look at because this was a win without Mo Salah as well, um, who's big. So let's go to Diego Jota. He opens the scoring 23rd minute. Bradley for Jota. Diego Jota right through the heart of them. So Connor Bradley is becoming a quick hero here. It's only a second Premier League appearance. Uh, I think he's 20 years of age. Is that what it is? Maybe even younger. Uh, he is from Northern Ireland. He was in the Liverpool Youth Academy moving over there. His team in Northern Ireland was Dungannon Swifts. Only a second Premier League appearance, 39th minute. He makes it 2-0. Bouncing off Fernandez. The spare man here is Bradley. Now what's he got? Connor Bradley! Now that is special! That's what he's got! He's now for the kid! And he's just fulfilled his every dream! Wow, that's something special, isn't it? Doesn't that that just really warms your heart to see a young guy like that? Uh, make that sort of impression, uh, no matter what team they're on. You know, you're always pulling for young talent and and talent to live up to the moment and the opportunities they get. He's obviously doing that. Now, this is very interesting because as a right back, uh, Trent Alexander has moved into midfield now. So now you're finding another option for him. Um, and again, this is done without Mo Salah, and there's a lot of younger names here being filtered into this team and new names for Liverpool as they rebud themselves. So Jurgen Klopp is not going to leave this a barren club when he leaves. Uh, it was maybe a little bit different with Sir Alex when he left Manchester United and David Moyes took over. Uh, but Liverpool restore a five-point lead at the top of the Premier League. This was a brutal beatdown. It continued in the 65th minute. Zabas lie scoring. That makes it 3-0. But here's Conor Bradley again for Liverpool. Oh, what a cross! What a goal! Dominic Sobislai's firm header. But the delivery was delicious. 
Mmm, delicious delivery. Makes me want to take a bite out of that delivery. Uh, so now he's got a goal and an assist here, right? Uh, Chelsea pull one back. Christopher and Cuckoo at the 71st minute mark. And Cuckoo wriggling and scoring. It's a really good goal there for Chelsea. One bright, sparky moment. And their evening comes to life. Yeah, but it uh, doesn't last long. Eight minutes later, Luis Diaz in the 79th. Callister. Luis. In goes Diaz! And wraps it up in front of the clock. So that makes it 4-1. to one. It's a big beatdown. By the way, in this game, uh, Darwin Nunez apparently had 10 shots. Um, that's six more than the entire Chelsea team had in this game. But the amazing thing is, he hit the post four times. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Four times, did not score, was visibly upset. One of them was a penalty. Um, it's not a bad position to be in. A striker who continues to find chances. Klopp was uh, highly uh, complimentary of him. Uh, his running, uh, the challenge he's causing opponents. But he can't score goals. Um and you're still finding opportunity. He is. And they're five points top of the league. And then you're just saying, okay, when this guy starts scoring goals, which you got to hope is soon, it's another bump you're going to get. But he's a runner. He had chance after chance in this game. And imagine if he starts taking them, right? Connor Bradley now is an option on the right, as we mentioned, with the announcement that Klopp is leaving. Who, by the way, when he took over in 2015, what did he say? I'm the normal one. Uh, I'm the normal one to the special one, Jose Mourinho. And he's going to move on. The love affair will end at the end of the season, but it'll never end, really. They are motivated. They are burying their teeth based on this result. And they better be, because Erling Holland is set to return at City along with a motivated Kevin De Bruyne, who's already returned. Um, noteworthy at the half, Mauricio Pochettino, Made three changes. Now, when you make three changes at halftime, it means you're not happy. Sorry. Um, means you're not happy, and you're upset at players. Liverpool, Arsenal on the weekend. Our good friend Andrew Carlson, uh, he will be watching that one. Okay, we got Tab Ramos coming on later in the show, one of the most technical players ever for the United States. Former Dynamo manager. His last stop was at New England as an assistant. But uh, Tab and I are going to bounce a number of topics around uh, tonight. 713-780-3776. Any thoughts out there, Liverpool fans, after the demolition of Chelsea at Anfield? Here is, uh, here is Jurgen Klopp, post-match analysis uh, against Chelsea in the 4-1 to win. To start the middle part, to finish, of course, uh, you have to play outstandingly well to keep Chelsea kind of calm because they're just too good, they're super talented, said before the game, that's how it is. But the way we started the game was um, really strong, proper direction, immediately put them under pressure, counter-pressing us top, winning balls back, keeping them really in areas where they don't want to be. The high press was really good, they couldn't play really the way they wanted, the build-up, because we were really there, the boys did extremely well, scored the goals. Fair to say we could have scored one or two more. So when your uh, pressing game is working, boy, that, and you're getting suffocated, it, it's the worst feeling. And you're getting suffocated in and around your own goal. And then there's these times you think you actually break the press and they repress and, and win the ball back. Uh, it, it's just chaos. And it just seems like sometimes that there's a 12th player out there. Um, okay, so here's, uh, here's uh, Jurgen Klopp on the youngster. Connor Bradley had a goal and an assist in this game. Um, he's incredible, incredible boy, um, wonderful. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't hear that, but people told me that the crowd was always singing his name. It's one, it's just great. Um, I think he's flying in a moment, and rightly so. He's he's working hard. He's um, a good footballer and um, helped us so much. It's uh, incredible, and it's another thing. I think back um, in the summer. I think there were quite a few people who said we need another right back, blah, 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 for, for different reasons. And um, we really were very positive about Kwon in that moment, like we were about Kwon, sir. Um, or now, um, I think, a real big step made. 
Now, if you're a Manchester United fan, um, there's something about today's 4-3 to three victory that you got to be happy about. But they had a 3-1 to one lead, and it ended up being a really, really crazy finish. And they win 4-3. to three. Kobe Mino, uh, 90 plus 7. Here's what the game winner sounded like. And he might ruin out some of those attacking yeah. players who's taken yes. off. But here's Kobe Mino! Kobe Mino, the teenager! Wow! May have won the game with his first goal of the Premier League! Holy smoke. Um, first call in the Premier League, youth is king, Kobe Mayno. So, you know, I was thinking about this today. Manchester United in the great days of Sir Alex Ferguson, it was all about the academy. And, and maybe this is the turnaround now, finally. Maybe it's the Kobe Maynos, the Alejandro Garnachos, the Willie Cambalas, uh, Omar Forson. Maybe these are the players that, are going to lead a wave of turning this club around because it didn't happen with the Jaden Sancho's Marcus Rashford up and down. Although after the tequila drinking binge put right in the starting lineup and did score the uh, opener for Manchester United, Ten Hag has come out recently saying, quote, we need players with balls. I think he must've been uh, reading Diego Simeone's book at Atletico Madrid. Ten Hag, we need players with balls in their own identity. He's not wrong. You get tired of watching guys who are highly talented that seemingly turn it on and off, right? Alex Ferguson built great United squads with players from their youth setup at Carrington. David Beckham, Scholes, Neville Brothers. That's the way it worked. So maybe it's back to tradition for United. Maybe the way back to consistency and higher up the table is going to be Manchester United uh, through youth. It's very important. Back to tradition. Liverpool 51 points, Man City 46, Arsenal 46, Spurs 43, Austin Villa 43, and West Ham has now dropped down to 35. So there's your five. Liverpool, City. It's a huge game for Arsenal. They got designs on winning the title. They want to win three points on Sunday. It's pretty exciting. Gio Reyna now uh, goes to Nottingham Forest. I like this. I love this, actually. Uh, He's not at a a top-of-the-table team in the Bundesliga like Dortmund. Now at a club that's in a relegation battle. He's going to have to deal with some things that maybe he hasn't dealt with before. This could be the best thing for him. Let's see if he lives up to it. I hope so because, like I've said before, he's getting the label of being injury-prone. That's kind of like father, like son, too. I think Claudio Reyna got in- injured a lot. It's kind of strange. But the environment of a club in a relegation battle, eh, that's a whole new ball game. Nottingham Forest. I wonder if he knows who uh, Brian Clough is, or Trevor Francis, or David Needham, or Viv Anderson. I wonder if he knows who those guys are. I wonder if he knows they won back-to-back European Cups, which is now called the Champions League. All right, we're going to take a break. Soccer Matters ESPN 97.5, presented by John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. Hugh O'Connor's Pub was uh, hopping today with Liverpool getting the win uh, recently. Um, Make that yesterday. Destroying Chelsea. Houston Liverpool supporters groups go there. Uh, It is Hugh O'Connor's Pub I-10, the Marquee Entertainment Center. Get out there. Great whiskey offering beer. Uh, They got all the traditional English food, fish and chips, shepherd's pie, uh, you name it, bangers and mash. It's a fantastic place. Go in there, see Dave and Goose. It is Hugh O'Connor's Pub. We take a break. We come back. One of the most technical players in the history of the U.S. men's national team. He is Tab Ramos coming up next. This is Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Brought to you by the Daspit Law Firm. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Glenn Davis. Goal! 
How about that? Vita Roque. Fourth appearance for Barcelona. He gets the game winner, a 1-0 victory. Uh, most minutes he's been on the field for Barcelona. They needed that. Xavi needed that. Uh, he played 29 minutes in this one. With that, we bring in uh, courtesy of John Daspit and the Daspit Law Firm. Technically one of the best ever to play for the United States. He's done it in World Cups. He's played in Spain, Liga MX, Major League Soccer. You know him as the former under-20 coach, and you know him as the former Houston Dynamo coach. He's Tab Ramos joining us now from New Jersey. Tab, how are you? Hi, Glenn. How are you? Thank you uh, for having me on. Always good Always good to have you on, Tab, and uh, thanks uh, for taking the time to do this live tonight. It makes it a lot better. I wanted to start off by taking you into your, your time with Tigris because, um, you know, the Monterey Clubs are so big here in Houston, and uh, your time at Tigris and kind of what it meant to you at that time period going to a Liga MX team um, with the history and tradition of a club like that? Well, I mean, I felt that, you know, uh, going to Tigres was a sort of a, a lucky move for me. I thought it was it was lucky that I would end up at, a, at such a great club. I mean, I was, I was coming from Betis at the time in Spain, which also is a, a, a great club with a huge fan base. Um, but, you know, in Mexico, you know, obviously there, you know, there, you have America and you have Chivas and, and then after that, it's really, you know, it's really up for grabs in terms of, you know, fan base, who are the bigger clubs. And, you know, although Tigres hadn't achieved all it's achieved now, uh, it was still a big club and I was really happy to go to a great city. And, uh, you know, that's one of the decisions in my life that, that, that I think were one of the best ones I made. So when we look at like Cade Cowell going to Chivas and we look at Brandon Vasquez, uh, who you know and have worked with uh, going to Rayados, you know, I hear a lot of people trying to condition this. Oh, you know, they should be going to Europe and all that. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't call this a lateral move. I mean, they're going to markets where they have more healthy pressure than they've ever faced in Major League Soccer. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, uh, you know, Mexican fans take their – their football very seriously and uh and there's a lot of pressure on those guys in particular you know obviously brandon vasquez going to rayados i think it's, it's a great move that's that's already working out great for him and for the club um he fit in perfectly into that into that roster um you know but chivas is a club that normally has even more pressure you know it's 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 one of the biggest if not the biggest in mexico in terms of fan base and and uh, in, in one of those clubs that, you know, the, the, the fan base really loves. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I you know as, as they made the move into Mexico, I thought, you know, here's two, you know, uh, although Brandon is not as young, I, I thought for um, Cal going to, going to Chivas is going to be a very difficult move. And I hope that, I hope that the club uh, protects them a little bit and gives them a little bit of time to adjust to the league and, and to make the type of impact that, that I think he can make. You know, with young players in your history, Coach, in the under-20s, in, in this case, it seems like Fernando Gago, who's the new head coach who took over for Velko Panovic at Chivas, has basically said, look, I, I'm, I'm throwing this guy in the deep end. He's come off the bench in two games. Um, what was your theory on that? Was that player by player based on personality? Or, you know, how would you integrate guys into squads? Well, I think it all depends and depends on what the, what the goals of the club, you know, obviously this is not, you know, for some clubs you have to win tomorrow because you have, you have certain uh, goals that you want to achieve right away. For some clubs, when you bring a, a, a younger player, it's about, you know, uh, having a plan to develop them into becoming the great player that you think he can become without burning them out before he even has a chance. So I think it's likely that at Chivas they will do it a little bit at a time. You know, he certainly has a lot of potential. Um, I think because of his 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 powerful frame and the way he plays, I think he will eventually make a big difference um, there and, and make a big difference for the club. But I think that there's no questions. There there's going to be some ups and downs, and sometimes the downs when you're at a big club, um, you know, the downs are very difficult, uh, and so. Hopefully they can shelter him f from that a little bit. You know, I liked his attitude. By the way, we're talking to Tab Ramos, uh, former under-20 coach, U.S. international, former Houston Dynamo coach as well. Um, I, I liked his attitude. He said, you know, uh, and he probably didn't know how uncomfortable it would be, but he said, 
you know, I really want to put myself as a, as a young player in uncomfortable positions, in an uncomfortable position. And, and this, this clearly is going to be very different. When, when you were at Tigris, and, and I remember playing once against Thunan Pumas in a thing called the Marlboro Cup, and, and you could tell, you know, they weren't respecting us as American players. Um, what was your experience when you went to Tigris? Were you the American guy and there was a higher profile on you, or was that bypassed? No, really. I mean, the, everything, you know, that I can say about Tigris was, was amazing, really. I mean, obviously it helped me a lot that I was coming from a club in Spain like Betis, you know, mm-hmm. which is a, you know, obviously, as you know, it's a big, big club. Uh, so that helped, you know, in terms of, you know, people already recognizing that I was going to be an impact player for the club. Um, but, but no, I mean, you know, if, if there's one thing I can say about the Tigris fans, you know, because all the fans would like to think that they support their club no matter what. There's good moments and there's some bad moments. But I can tell you that of all the places where I've been, you know, T- Tigris is the one place where the fans were consistent regardless. They they love, you know, the jersey. They love the club. And, and sometimes you go through losses and sometimes you lose at home and, and, and you go through bad times. But, but Tigris fans just really love their club regardless. And and it's true, and you know, and this is why I was so happy for you know for Tigres in the last you know let's let's say twelve fourteen years and all of the success that club has had because I know that that those fans would be the same if the club uh, was not having all that success, uh, and so really happy for them that they got to live all these moments. Um, as a, as I uh, listen to Tab here, a reminder, you know, Tab playing at Batiste and Tigris back in those days, this is trailblazing stuff uh, like John Harks at Sheffield Wednesday and, and others. This is a trail, trailblazing time here that basically uh, you can draw a direct line to what's happening with Cade Cowell at Chivas and also with Brandon Vasquez at, at Rayados. So can you reflect on a Tigris-Rayados game that you played in? I actually didn't play one. Um, you know, one of them I had a red card, and another one I had I was injured, so I didn't get to play the. I didn't get to play the derby while I was there. How about a, a an America game or or against Chivas? You got a good memory from one of those? Yeah, I mean those are those are huge games. Obviously, you know what Tigers fans are like. In particular, playing those games are ho- at home. Uh, you know, with the stadium packed. Um, you know, those are things that you don't you don't forget. You don't forget how loud the crowd is, how much into it they are, how much they support you on every good play that you make, how much they encourage you sometimes when you don't make the right play. Uh, it's a very, you know, uh, El Volcan is a very special place to play in. Tab Ramos joining us here tonight. Tab, uh, we saw that Jay Reyna has now moved to Nottingham Forest. Um, first segment, I was talking a little bit about that, and I thought, you know, maybe this could be a great environment from him to go from a Bundesliga team that is in and around the top of the table all the time to a team that has a lot of different dynamics fighting for, you know, to avoid ve- relegation. Um, and maybe this brings the best out of a Gio Reyna. Well, I mean, I think that's—I think it's great the way you just you phrased that that whole question because uh, if it was a question, it was more of a statement. But uh, I, uh, you know, I agree with you. I agree with you because I think if anything, you know, we've we've all been talking about Giorena for the last four or five years about how he could potentially be that next, you know, that next great guy that has some special qualities that other guys don't have, and yet we, you know, we we've, we've seen flashes of that. Um, but but I think going to the EPL will will challenge him to do the things that we have not seen him do, which is you know cover ground from from one side to the other, play for a team that actually is struggling to get the ball back, and now he has to make the play, um, and he has to he has to be a player that that uh, that helps them in that relegation battle, which which puts them under pressure in every game. You know, at, at Dortmund is a little bit different. You know, Dortmund's roster is better than the opposing team uh, game after game, unless they play Bayern. And uh, all the other games, they really they dominate and they have the ball. And, and a lot of the times that Gio Reyna would get the ball would be, you know, maybe the last 30, last 35 yards. And now I think he's going to find himself on a team where he has now 60 yards in front of him. Uh, and by the way, when they lose the ball, you got to get all the way back. And so I think it's going to, I think it's going to make them be the best he can be. The other thing is, 
that I think has been really important because I think sometimes sometimes when we think of his situation and him finding a, a different club, we think, oh, well, you know, maybe the coach didn't like him. Um, I think the fact was he was injured a lot. Uh, he never developed a consistency at, at, at Dortmund except for, I believe, either three or four years ago where he played a bunch of games in a row. Since then, the last three years have been really inconsistent in terms of him being keeping himself on the field. And that's, that's, that's the key. If you, if you can't keep yourself healthy, then it's hard to challenge for a position. So uh, he's, he's one that's had a lot of injuries, and we saw that already with the youth national teams when he was already 15 and 16 years old. Um, so hopefully this is the time where he can keep healthy. And if he does well at this club, I expect like really, really big things from him in the future. Yeah, I think this is a great moment for her, him, a huge opportunity. And I agree with you. Uh, you. He's probably at the threshold of being very careful not to be labeled as a guy that's injury prone. Yeah, that's the, that's the challenge. I think now people are willing to forget. You know, now he's in the league where everyone will watch every move that he makes because although Dortmund is obviously a huge club, not everybody watches the Bundesliga all the time. And and I think now the EPL is, is the most watched league in the world and he's at a place where, where people are watching. And when he steps on the field, everybody knows what he's going to do and how much he's going to play. So I, I think I think he, he needed a move like this. And, and you know, obviously I, I don't know Gio as well. You know, I've talked to him quite a few times because he was coming to my under-20s, you know, when I left to go to Houston. Um, but I obviously know his parents too, and they're people who are very committed. And, and I think Gio will – you know, will likely be the same. He'll be hungry to do the best he can, and, and maybe this is the move that, that he needed to get over the hump finally. Well, I'm rooting for him. I think I, I think it is a great move. Um, your time at the Dynamo. Now, look, you, you, I'm going to say this because I know you probably won't, but I think all of us realize that you didn't have the resources that, that are currently here with the club. But, you know, take us into that time period. It was very difficult. You had the pandemic to deal with. Um just talk about that and, and, and the risk maybe taking that job and the timing of that coaching position for you. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll start with this. You know, my obviously, you know, as a coach, you always think that regardless of the situation you're put, you're put in, that you're, you're going to do well. Because you think, hey, no matter what, I'm going to get these players to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do the other. Um, the reality was, you know, I walked into Houston Dynam and after playing – I think it was our second game. We went into we we went into COVID um, for like the next four or five months, and then we appeared at that bubble in Orlando. So my whole first year at at Houston was really more like a half a year, and it was it was a mess. Like it was really for everyone in the rest of the world. By the way, it wasn't just in soccer. So that was my my introduction. Having said that, I, you know I was really happy to go to Houston. I, I knew the situation would be difficult. I knew that ownership was likely looking to to get out so there wasn't going to be investment um so there wasn't there wasn't a lot in houston that i didn't know was going to happen so i have to take full responsibility for that but you know when you call me to be on your show and i'm on the show in houston i'm like i I have no hard feelings at all i loved houston i love the fans there they were good to me obviously they're going to be upset when they lose games but i i you know i really i enjoyed my experience there i think we brought in, in my time there, we brought some players because obviously we didn't have money to buy players. So we brought some players like Griffin Dorsey for free. We we got Carasquilla on a on, on somewhat of a free loan from a second division team in Spain. We tried to get Corey Baird with Gam. Uh, you know, we we drafted Ethan Bartlow uh, in the second year, which was the first year that we really took charge of the draft. So like we were starting to bring young players, but obviously. You know, normally in professional soccer, you have to win now, and uh, and we didn't. And and when you don't win, you know, normally you lose your job. <laughs> so so that's what happens. But I I root for Houston. You know, I was really happy when they won the cup this year. You know, I tweeted something out because it was I was actually not only happy for the club, but happy for Griffin Dorsey because he had gone when we took him on in 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 Houston. He was basically a free agent. You know, he had basically gotten released out of Toronto and didn't have a team. And we believed in him, and to see him where he is now, I, I mean, I couldn't be prouder of the effort he's made and, and the player he's become. So there's a lot of good that happened uh, coming out of Houston, although obviously the results were not, and that's, you know, that stinks, obviously. 
you, you know, there's many a broadcast that I did last year that, you know, I reminded people that, you know, you and your staff were the ones who brought Griffin Dorsey here. And, uh, you know, it was remarkable where he's come. Honestly, I, I think he was such a big piece of the turning point of that season last year with the width that he brought to the team with Karaskia playing kind of more in the interior and kind of a hybrid role. But um, so that obviously is something that you're very, very proud of. Um, just a real quick hit here on um, what we saw today on television from you, because I know this gets conditioned in a lot of ways. I know it's preseason for Inter Miami. On the other hand, there is a risk when you go on a world tour with the guy that just won the World Cup uh, less than a year ago uh, in uh, Lionel Messi, and, and then to get smacked in Saudi Arabia 6 nothing. Um, it's not the best of things, right? Well, I mean, you no, know, I and I agree with you. You know, I'm a little bit surprised you asked me this question, but but it's it's there's no there's no doubt. I mean, th- here's the thing. You know, you 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 brought Messi on board, and and the good part of that is that the rest of the world is now watching, and the bad part of that is the rest of the world is now watching, and so and so now this is sort of a showcase game for MLS. Even though, of course, here we can downplay it as a preseason game. It doesn't matter. I mean, most of the fans here don't really pay attention in preseason anyway, so most of the fans aren't going to know. But I tell you who knows, the people overseas, because they're keeping score. And and I think I think in general, this is a bad look today. Yeah. Uh, it was a bad look, and, you know, especially Ronaldo didn't even play. You're playing the second-place team in Saudi Arabia. You know, it's a chance you take. And, and in all fairness to Inter Miami, you know, not necessarily their fault. I mean, they, they you know, they're trying to make some money back. They... They're in preseason when the other team is in the middle of their season. Um, even without Ronaldo, you know, obviously Al Nassar was, was a lot better. And, uh, you know, and then you have, you know, headlines in Spain saying it was a humiliating loss for into Miami. And, and now you got to deal with that. And now you have to erase that perception. So I, I think it was, it was a tough, I think it was a tough result today for, for into Miami and, and, and for MLS really, unfortunately. You know, I, I was thinking about you and your relationship with Jurgen Klinsmann because obviously he's with South Korea in the Asian Cup. And um, just real quick on on Jurgen, because rem- I just always remember when he was pushing the American player to take the risk and get overseas, and, and there was so much backlash against that. And now look where we are. There's Americans playing everywhere. There's buying and selling going on uh, business-wise. I mean, he saw it. Yeah, I mean, from that from that standpoint, you know, Jurgen opened up a lot of doors, uh, and he made the German sort of gain that confidence in the American player, because Jurgen was the first one to say over there in Germany that American players could really play, and a lot of doors opened for the younger players there. And I, I think it was a great, um, it was great for U.S. soccer that we had him around for that period of time. You know, in terms of. You know, obviously, the way he left, you know, like any coach, you know, when you don't get results, eventually you get fired. Um, that that's kind of the way that goes. And now in 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 South Korea, frankly, the team has not been playing all that great. Uh, but I think this last game against Saudi Arabia, I don't know if you have had a chance to watch, but I I've watched pretty much all the games of the Asian Cup, and and it's been amazing, really. I mean, it's you know the, the games have been really difficult. Sun has not been that player uh, to lead the team yet, and I think they. Maybe this Saudi Arabia game that they just won on penalties is the the one game that gets uh, gets them over the hump, and 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 maybe they have a real shot to win the whole thing now. Tab, real quick before we let you go, what's next for Tab Ramos? Um, yeah, at this point, I'm I'm not really sure. I know that I'm not really in a hurry to leave where I am now. You know, I'm in New Jersey. Obviously, I spent two years in Houston. You know, I spent a little time in in the USL. I spent a little time in New England. Uh, with the revolution, which I enjoyed, to be to be honest, but I, I kind of want to be home. My daughter has two years remaining in high school, and and I, I don't want to move at this point. I just I just renewed my contract with Telemundo, uh, so I'll be doing the U.S. games on Telemundo, like I did. You know, the I did the uh, Slovenia game uh, last week or the week before, uh, so I'll be doing that. So I'll be doing TV. I'm doing some consulting and a couple other things. Um, uh, but in general, I'll I'll be around here. I'm not necessarily looking forward to go, going somewhere else. Well, that's good. I'll tune in because you can help me with my Spanish, okay? 
All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Tab, thanks so much for coming on. Great interview. We uh, appreciate it. You're one of the best. Thank you for coming on the show tonight. And I have to say this before you cut me off. I have to say I want to thank you for all the work that you do in Houston because you've been doing it for decades. And I know that the fans are really appreciative of what you do for the city of Houston. So uh, thank you for that. That's very kind of you. Thanks, Tab. Have a great night. We appreciate you coming on. That's Tab Ramos. Um, some really good insight there. We talk about a guy who played in World Cups. Believe it or not, he was on a team, the New Jersey Eagles and the Miami Sharks, and I played against him in the ASL, I think it was. But he was a young guy then. He was a lot younger than me. But he was the guy back then everybody was talking about. Um, I think Peter Vermees was on one of his teams too because I was marking Peter Vermees. But, you know, they were some of the young names, the up-and-comers that were getting a lot of publicity. But Tab... Tab was really up there with uh, being a special player, and ultimately that worked out, playing at Tigris and Batiste and in World Cups for the U.S. All right, we'll take a break. we got a lot to come here. Final segment, 713-780-3776. 713-780-3776. This is the Black Keys, Gold on the Ceiling. By the way, if you want to get that album, you know where you go? Go to Cactus Music, the best in vinyl. We'll take a break. This is Soccer Matters on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Brought to you by the Daspit Law Firm. From the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here's Glenn Davis. In a line on the edge of their penalty area. Griezmann heads that one down to Molina. Griezmann with the cross. Memphis attacking the ball. He's gone in. And this time it will count. It's the last minute of the game. And it's Memphis Depay who gets the goal. The referee surrounded, but Atletico players celebrate. You know, there's a thing called intro music. This is good intro music. That is if you're a rocker and you like hair bands, rat. It's called Dance, Dance, Dance. All right, that was the Atletico Madrid winner from Memphis to Pi, uh, 92nd minute, two minutes into stoppage time against Rayo Vallecano, Casey Keller's former team, and two to one victory for Atletico Madrid. Um, by the way, that was an excellent interview with Tom Ramos. Anything jump out in that interview to you, Guillermo? I love the way that it was just such a casual conversation between colleagues and professionals that have given so much to the city of Houston specifically jumping out I loved how much he backed Griffin uh Griffin Dorsey you know I, I it's, it's so much merit to that guy everybody's on his back everybody's pushing him forward and I'm so glad that he's getting the love he deserves he is getting a lot of love Griffin Dorsey and he deserves it because the man has worked at it he's earned a bigger contract um, we visibly, if you're paying attention, you visibly saw the improvement in him in so many different ways. And, you know, I think sometimes people are hesitant to give a little bit too much credit to certain things that happen in a season, but his emergence as a right back to bring width to the team, to counter what was going on on the other side of the field, to pose challenges for opponents. Um, and people had to game plan for him. Tata Martino did. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, if you know football and you're watching it, you can tell what people are trying to do because they realized what a big piece of driving the ball forward was, uh, you know, in, in, in the dynamo and attack. And, 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 you know, the effect that he then has on others, right, by bringing width to this team. So it was good stuff. Okay, uh, Real Madrid beat Hatafe today. Yosalu... Uh, Osalu uh, had a, a brace in this one. Uh, let's uh, hear from one of his goals. There is Vasquez. A little slip from the defender allows him to get the cross in. And that is punishment from Joselu. All right, so Joselu. So, listen, the Madrid derby's on Sunday. That's Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid. You got a big one for Brandon Vasquez. I mean, we got some real... We th This is not optional. This is... This is absolute must-see TV this weekend. So it's Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid. I think Brandon Vasquez now going into the cauldron uh, of passion, which is Club America and Azteca Stadium. I, I think 
that's another one to really keep an eye on this weekend. So we got some very, very good games. All right. Um, so today, the game winner that Kobe Mino scored for United in the 4-3 to three victory, uh, there's a lot of people saying that he resembles Clarence Seydorf a little bit, the great Dutchman who won the European Cup with, I think, three or four teams. Uh, Seydorf, the other day, and I want to make sure I get this soundbite in, but the other day Clarence Seydorf was talking about the best player that he ever played with. Take a listen to this. I've answered that question uh, without hesitation uh, during my whole career. For me, Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, has been from a different uh, species. Yeah. When somebody can repeat the same thing or, uh, whenever he wants, uh, then it's not luck, for sure. But I think that uh, nobody has been able to uh, unite uh, speed, strength, vision of the game, execution, and be concrete all those elements together. I've seen players that can do dribbles like nobody, they can score maybe like nobody, um, but the intelligence, every, the full package was, um, yeah, in- incredible. I love, the, uh, I, I love the Dutch accent. Schmoke and a pancake? Where's your fascia? Where's my fascia? That's good stuff from Clarence Seedorf there. Okay, so... Um, couple of things I want to get into. Most expensive signing ever in FC Dallas history. Peter Musa from Benfica, 25 years old. They spent a $9.7 million transfer fee. Could rise to $13 million with add-ons. Alan Velasco was out injured. He was the top guy at $7 million prior to that. Uh, so this is a historic signing. He's a DP. 44 appearances, 12 goals for Benfica. They've got a lot in him. L.A. Galaxy pick up Gabriel Peck from Vasco da Gama, 22 years old, a winger and attacking midfield type player. Uh, L.A.F.C. I think it's L.A.F.C. who's going to get uh, David Martinez, right? Venezuelan, who, by the way, today had an assist in a Venezuela 3-1 to win over Brazil uh, in Olympic qualifiers. They're also adding a youth international, Tomas Angel, a 20-year-old. 20, uh, 20 Dynamo are linked to Jan Gregush. Uh, at this moment, I don't know if that has gone through, but that is uh, to bolster things in midfield. There's no idea how long Hector Herrera is going to be out, but the way Major League Soccer goes, I mean, you know, depending on what this injury is, the seriousness of it, you know, he may, you know, rush it back as long as you're getting results, right, and you're staying in the thick of things in the playoff hunt. Maybe he comes back in the summertime. Uh, No telling. Uh, A lot going on here. World Cup 2026 update brought to you by Soccer Matters Sunday to Central Time. Fox and Telemundo announced the host city allocations, cities that will host the tournament's opening matches for the three host countries, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. You'll get group stage locations for East Host Country's national team and the venue for the final, which we already know is Jerry Jones's Palace. That's the World Cup 2026 Update. Soccer Matters t-shirts, you get them at lamontbrands.com, all to the 501c charity Snowdrop Foundation. Tomorrow, you got Nigeria, Angola, you got Congo, Guinea. Saturday, you got Mali, Ivory Coast, Cape Verde, Bafana, Bafana of South Africa. So you are down to the quarterfinals. Big one for the Super Eagles. Um, Keep a big, big eye now on the host nation, the Ivory Coast, uh, against the very tough Mali. So that's an interesting one. Lindsey Horan, the, the U.S. captain, national team, was interviewed uh, in The Athletic. Um, had a lot of very interesting clo- quotes. And I give her a lot of credit for speaking her mind and speaking out. Talking about the World Cup and no joy uh, amongst the players, She had a quote that said, quote, American soccer fans, most of them aren't smart. They don't know the game. They don't understand. Um, Not sure I agree with that 100%. Uh, Maybe that's the type of fan that's being attracted to the NWSL uh, partially and MLS partially because people go to games for a lot of differing reasons. Some people just go for the social aspect. Uh, They don't go for the tactical aspect. That's okay. Um, She then went on to say, quote, we did not get the best out of every individual. But you can't interview a national team player, okay, uh, as a writer about the World Cup 
and not talk about the obvious problem with that national team and the way it did its business, which was to get very politicized. And you can't tell me that that did not affect that team. There were people there for their own individual um, gains. Very selfish. We all know who they are. I don't have to even mention them, but you can't do an article with somebody like that without asking the obvious question about the infiltration of politics into the U.S. national team. And that's why we're back in the new manager, Emma Hayes, because I think Emma Hayes is going to get this thing back to football and not this other nonsense that gets integrated into the game of soccer as far as platforms. Um, politics is not good for, the, for sports. It certainly wasn't good for the U.S. women's national team. They were lucky to get out of their group. Uh, let's hope that changes. All right, that's going to do it tonight here. Soccer Matters, ESPN 97.5. Hit me up on Twitter and Instagram, uh, at Glenn Davis Sock. Facebook Soccer Matters, glendavissoccer.com, as we shamelessly promote. Uh, get over to YouTube, Soccer Matters. We need you to subscribe. My guy, my guy Guillermo, is getting it done there. The likes, the hits, subscribing, getting involved. That's going to keep this on the radio. Uh, but we're calling out for you right now. All right, that's going to do it tonight. Soccer Matters, ESPN 97.5, Daspit Law Firm.